Almighty God, Holy Heavenly Father, we stop and we give you thanks and praise and we just acknowledge your greatness and who you are. And Father, as we think about those things and we are just mindful, Father, of our limitations and the things that frustrate us and the things that we just so easily fall into sometimes, Lord, the sin that so easily ensnares us and entangles us, Father, we ask that you will deliver us from those things, deliver us from those things, and help us to move away from things that keep us away from you. And Lord, we just thank you for the fact that you hear us, that you that you care about us, that you love us, that you know us in unique ways that we don't even understand or know ourselves. That you are concerned about major world events, that you're also concerned about minor events in our lives as well. And Lord, we just uh, thank you for those things and we acknowledge all of this as well. Lord, we also just ask and pray, Father, that you'll help us to stay focused upon our worship today, that you'll help us to focus upon singing to you. Also, Lord, we ask that as uh, we hear your word preached to us today, that we have attentive hearts and minds, that we listen to what Scripture is teaching, what you have to do. Lord, we want to uh, see this church grow. We want it to grow, Father, closer to you. Spiritually, Father, we also we want to grow numerically. And we ask that you'll give us opportunities for the gospel to help us to invite people, to help us to encourage people, that other people could, could hear your word and could grow closer to you and know your son. Father, thank you for watching over us and guiding us as you do. In Jesus' name, amen. We will glorify the King of kings. We will
Jesus and his, his death and uh, what it means in my life. Uh, when, I was, when I was younger, all I thought I could find it in was the end of the Gospels. <laughs> um, you know, that's just where it happens. So that's where I was, you know, oh, well, this, this is it. Uh, and then I, I got older and I started reading a little bit of, of Paul's letters with, with intent. And uh, in, in Romans chapter 8, in verses 31 to 39, Paul is, to me, one of the most powerful, powerful things about Christ's death and his resurrection and what it means for you and for me. And so uh, I just want us to read it and then, and then we'll pray to the bread. In Romans chapter 8. Starting in verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us, who shall separate us from the love of Christ, shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword. As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's pray. Lord, you are a powerful and mighty God. And right now, as we have a time to honor your love for us, I pray that we all do it with a heart and a mind that is set on you, Lord. Allow us to always know that your death and your resurrection and all that it means for us, Lord, is that no longer death separates us from you, but we have life. And Lord, as we're gathered together, I pray for this bread represents your body. I pray that we do this in a, in a way that, it, that is pleasing to you and our heart in the right places, our mind in the right place. I thank you so much. To your name we pray, amen. Lord, once again, as we uh, as we come before your throne, and we're mindful of we're mindful of grace. We're mindful of the mercy that you've shown us, Lord. And we know that that, uh, that came with price. The Lord, we cannot pay, but Lord, we're thankful that you did on our behalf. Um, Lord, we pray right now for, for the cup uh, that represents your, your blood that was shed on the cross, Lord. We just pray that you, uh, that as we, as we take this, Lord, that once again we take it in a way that uh, our hearts, our minds, 
directed and focused on you. Lord, just thank you. Thank you so much. In your name we pray. Amen. Continuing to grow, 
that can lead us to have the right approach when it comes to our assurance of salvation. So that, so that, uh, when, when somebody asks you, are you saved, you don't, you don't really have to say, well, I hope so. Rather, you can say, I trust that it is so, based on these things. And, and so that was our study last week. But now this week, we follow that up with a question, what about those who do actually struggle, who reject Christ and find themselves, although once in grace, now you've fallen away? You rejected Jesus. And that's what we're going to look at together this morning from the Gospel of John as we think about this further subject of assurance. I have a friend, uh, he's my college roommate. He uh, is a nurse practitioner in Atlanta. And he has become a health nut. And he's involved in something called the carnivore diet. I don't know how many of you ever heard of this. You just basically eat chicken and fish and steak and eggs and you just enjoy you know, all the things they've always told us are bad for us. He's eating them all the time. And there are only two things that he posts on his social media. One thing is he's always posting his workouts because he's kind of at that stage where he's doing that sort of thing. The other thing is he's always posting what he ate that day. So every single meal, he takes a picture of it and he posts it on Instagram. Every single breakfast, lunch, dinner, also any snacks he has in between. He's taking a picture of that stuff and he's posting it. And I gotta tell you, I'm, I love him. He was my college roommate. I'm this close to unfollowing him. Okay? <laughs> because I'm tired of seeing the things that you eat and the things that you're lifting and all this stuff. I, I'm not really that interested. But it got me in a sort of in a, in a side cul-de-sac interest very briefly. Did you know that there are 16 million posts a year that people make of the things they eat. It's one of the major things that you'll ever find on Facebook. People are always posting things that they eat. Eating is a major part of our lives. I read somewhere we, you know, we spend uh, just an unbelievable amount of time eating out of our total, uh, out of our year, 35,000 hours. Each human being eats roughly one ton of food. You know, you ever heard somebody say, well, I ate a ton. Well, yeah, you did last year, probably, okay? And that's the way that works. You know, I, I see all these options for eating. When I was growing up, my mom gave me two choices, take it or leave it. And that was it, right? How about this morning we have breakfast with Jesus? And what he is going to give us is a very simple meal, spiritual meal, but one also that is incredibly deep and nuanced. And it's going to be beautiful in that respect. So we're going to be in John chapter 21 for the most part. We're going to pick it up in verse 1, where you'll find in your Bible the very first two words say, after this. This is a couple of words John uses. It's a favorite of the Apostle John throughout the Gospel of John. Metatauta. It's these two words from Tuto, this thing. Metatauta. He's saying this over and over in his gospel. After this, after this, after this. My question to you in verse 1 is, after what? I think my best guess is verse 29 from the previous chapter where he's just made a resurrection appearance uh, to have this conversation with Thomas. But he's revealing himself to them in that moment. And now here in John chapter 21, we have him revealing himself again. After that... And it says he reveals himself, verse 1, to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. Now, you may wonder where that is. And just by way of reminder, this is that same body of water that's given about four or five different titles in scriptures. The Sea of Galilee, you know, the Sea of Gennesaret. It's that same body of water around which many significant events in the life of Jesus took place. Okay? And this one is no different. So verse 2, hey, in your mind, count the number of names. We have Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the two sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples, unnamed, were together. In verse 3, Simon Peter says, depressed from the death of his Lord, I'm going fishing. And what do the other disciples do? 
We're following you. And so they go out and they get back to work, so to speak, in their everyday lives. Verse 3, they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. All right, y'all ready to do something a little, I think it's, uh, you know, we're, we're going to take, I don't want to give anybody whiplash, but what I want to invite you to do is to take your ribbon in your Bible and put it right here in this text and go with me now to Luke 5 for just a moment. We're coming back to John 1, 21. But I want to take a detour for just a second in Luke chapter 5 at an earlier event in Jesus' ministry where he encountered the disciples by this same sea. Now, anytime you're reading the Bible and you start studying about what you're going to discover is there are a lot of really cool things in details. Small details, they don't seem like they matter that much, but they actually are meant, meant to matter. In Luke's gospel, there's this phrase that's what we call an inclusio. It's kind of like a bookend. You have, you know, on your bookshelves, you usually have something that's going to hold the books in place. And this is a, the same thing with a literary device. On the one hand, at the beginning of this uh, chapter 5, we have this phrase where the people were pressing in to hear him. But by the end of Luke's gospel, there is the same phrase, phrase. They're pressing in, but now the, the tide of opinion has shifted. They're pressing in to crucify him. But we're at the beginning of that. And you'll notice in Luke 5, verse 4, the same scenario is taking place. I don't think this is by accident. Peter's been out on the water all night, hasn't caught a thing. But he comes back to shore, and in verse 4, Jesus requests slash commands him to go and put the net out into deep water once again. Now that deep water, they thought of it as very mysterious. You know, we don't know a whole lot about the oceans anymore in our modern age than they did. But the way they thought about it was it was the, the place of chaos. Everything evil, from the Philistines to the mysterious creatures beneath the surface of the sea, all of that was associated with deep water. But it also became very much associated with Gentiles because of that. And Jesus is going to make a little metaphor out of this whole thing. So look at your verse 3. Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. You almost can tell the frustration in his response. Then almost, you know, if we could read some sarcasm in this, but at your word, because you apparently know everything about fishing, even though it's my business, I will let down the net. And so he does that. Verse 6, when they had gone out and done this, he enclosed a large number of fish. Their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and to help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. Jesus is making an incredible miracle take place in this moment. Now my question to you is, what would you do if you were, the, if you were Simon? In your business, you were a fisherman. And this guy, you haven't been able to, to catch any fish. You're not, that means you're not making any money. And Jesus just shows up at your business and all of a sudden, here's all this huge catch. I think what I might be tempted to do is just to riff, draw out a contract and go over to Jesus and say, hey, would you consider coming by just one time a month and we can replicate this for my business? But I want you to notice, he doesn't do that. And the reason, I think, is because he senses in the person of Jesus something greater, something holy, something sacred. So that in verse 8, it says, he fell down to his knees before Jesus and said, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. And Jesus, rather than being harsh, is merciful to him. He says, do not be afraid. From now on, you'll be catching men. Remember that? No fishers of men thing that Jesus tends to talk about. All right, so let's go back then to, well, that is our backdrop. That's our backdrop from what's happened earlier. Let's now go back to John 21, and we're going to look at this restoration of Peter. And I want to encourage you to not skip over the details, because some of these details are going to seem insignificant, 
But John, our author, is a master storyteller. And he's going to be interweaving some themes that he's already talked about in the gospel. First thing out of the gate, though, I want to make this very apparent, is that Jesus in our text is presenting himself as the ruler over all things. All throughout the Old Testament, God the Father was the ruler over all things, and he had all authority over you know, the birds of the air and the beasts of the sea. And Jesus is about to give that same presentation of his own authority. So let's think about that just for a moment. Notice in your verse 1, it says, this is a moment in which Jesus was revealed to his disciples. Notice down in verse 14, we have that same phrase. He's being revealed to his disciples. This is kind of framing, there's that, there's that literary device again, those bookends, framing this section about a revealing of the deity of Jesus. So now we're back to our text where in verse 2 we saw this number of disciples. Y'all remember how many you counted? I counted seven. There are seven disciples present. And that is a number that's associated throughout the Bible with creation. But Jesus is there too. So if we counted him, we get eight. And eight was always associated with the new creation of God through Christ. And Jesus is said to have risen on the eighth day. The day after the Sabbath, they call it. And so we have here a dawning of a new day going on. And so look at your verse 4. It says, just as the day was breaking. And again, the details matter. Because all through John's Gospel, there's this huge symbolism between night and day. Do you remember in John chapter 3, one of the rulers of the Jews, Nicodemus, he came to Jesus by night. That's significant because he was in the dark as to who Jesus actually was. In John chapter 2, it says that, that those who hated the light did so because their lives were filled with darkness. So now John's returning to this thing. Verse 4, there's a new dawn breaking. A new day has arrived. The time of God's work is at hand. And so just as the day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore. The disciples didn't know that it was him. Verse 5, Jesus said to them, children, look at your translation. Do you have any fish? Some of you will have a, a negative response uh, reflected in your, your translation where it's expecting a ne negative response. It'll say something like, you don't have any fish, do you? And that's the meaning here. And we're kind of being led to remember these previous moments. And, and notice this. This is why we looked at Luke 5. Look at verse 6. It says, He said to him, Cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it and now they were not able to haul it in because of the great quantity of fish. Now remember, God was said to be the ruler over all things. What the ancient Hebrews thought about the world, they didn't think of it in scientific terms the way we do. They thought of it in theological terms. Everything had a meaning toward God. So they thought of the heavens and the earth and the seas beneath the earth. They thought of these as realms. And God was the ruler over all the realms in creation. Can I pause here and just ask you, do you believe God is the ruler over all things? you believe He's in control? Do you believe He's still, in spite of all the, the terrible things we see in the world, but he is still the ruler over all. Various times in Scripture we find God exercising his power in order to demonstrate his authority over the created world. Sometimes it was for judgment. Sometimes it was for rescue. We'll think about one of those in just a moment. But notice here at the beginning of verse 7, what does it say? It says, that disciple whom Jesus loved. I always get a kick out of that. Because who's writing it? You know, John does this. There's another instance. I don't know if y'all, there's a cute video, a kind of cool video that's out about this. But John also is, uh, he makes it a point to talk about going to the empty tomb. And, him, and Peter, they ran to the tomb. And the disciple whom Jesus loved says, but I got there first. 
I outran Peter. He was too slow, right? Notice verse 7. He's the disciple whom Jesus loved. Out of at least 500 followers of Jesus, there were 120 who were really close disciples. They're the ones in the upper room in Acts. Out of that 120, there were 12 who were designated to be apostles. Out of that 12, there were three who were Jesus' closest associates, Peter, James, and John. And out of those three, there was one who claimed I was his favorite. And so the favorite one, verse 7, says to Peter, it's the Lord. He's the one that recognizes that Peter, in Peter fashion, jumps out of the boat and starts swimming to shore. Very interesting. Verse 8, the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish. For they were not far from the land, but about 100 yards off. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. By the way, uh, scholars, do y'all know, this is an old, terrible preacher joke, okay? It's going to be really, I'm just going to tell you ahead of time, it's really bad. Do y'all know how Jesus makes breakfast? <coughs> breakfast. That's it. <laughs> That's the whole joke. It's really bad. I know. <laughs> but he's making breakfast. Charcoal fire. Make the middle of Verse 8. They came in the boat dragging the net full of fish. They got out on land. Verse 9. Saw the fire in place. Jesus says to them, verse 10, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So, Simon Peter, verse 11, went aboard, hauled the net ashore, full of large fish. How many does your, your Bible say he caught? 153 of them. And although there were so many, the, let were, the net was not torn. Now, can anybody think of a moment in Old Testament history where God showed himself to be the ruler over all things, maybe in the most dramatic way we've ever seen? I think the, the greatest event of the Old Testament, greater even than creation, is said to be the Exodus in which the Red Sea was parted. And it's in that moment that God demonstrated Himself to be ruler over all things. And there are many texts in Scripture which celebrate that event. One of those is found in Psalm 74, verses 12 and following, where it's talking about the Exodus event. It says, Yet God, my King, is from old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. Verse 13 you divided the sea by your might. Talking about Red Sea Exodus. You broke the heads of the sea monsters, the Tanim. You, verse 14, crushed the head of the Leviathan. And what did you do? You gave him as food for the creatures of the wilderness. This is an interesting text because in symbolic fashion, it's essentially saying God led his people through the Red Sea killed the great creatures of the sea and fed his people with them. And now we have another miraculous event in which God in flesh is feeding his people with the creatures of the sea. Now why is there 153? This is really not something we need to spend time on. Other than to say that was thought to be the number of the total number of nations on earth. So Jesus is getting me metaphorical about this whole catch already. But I want you to see verse 12. He says, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread, gave it to them, and so with the fish. And this was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. All right, I want to do something right now. And if I lost you back there somewhere with disinterest, whatever, um, this is important. I want you to notice what it says, that when they came ashore, they noticed there was a fire. And do, you, do any of you notice in your text, does it say what kind of fire it was? Anybody notice what kind of fire it was? It will say it was a 20, 21.9, a charcoal fire. Fire. Now remember I told you, John does this sort of thing with seemingly insignificant details, but they actually matter. Because here's where it gets interesting. What if I told you that 
charcoal, the word anthracos, what if I told you this word is found only two times in the entire New Testament? Both of those times are in the Gospel of John, and both of them involve Peter. So, 1818 is a moment where we read about another charcoal fire. And it's in this moment when Jesus is being put through a trial, and Peter's following from a distance, and he gathers around this charcoal fire, and people begin to question him about whether or not he's a follower of Jesus. It's this moment, are you listening? It's this moment when Peter denies Jesus. And it's around a charcoal fire. I think that's important because here John is making it a point, not just to say fire, here's another charcoal fire. And I think this seemingly insignificant detail is going to be Important because it is here where Jesus is going to restore Peter. So the first charcoal fire reminded Peter of his disobedience to Jesus. This second one is going to remind him forevermore of the time that Jesus reached out to him and provided mercy. So Jesus reveals himself first as the ruler of all things, but second, also he reveals himself as the forgiver of of all people. And I want us to see this kind of unfold because now there's a conversation that's about to take place. And I hope you'll, you'll dial into this because it's very important. It's a, it's a conversation Jesus has with his disciples, but now it's going to narrow down in focus to where Jesus is speaking directly back and forth with Peter himself. And again, it's around this fire, this charcoal fire, where Peter had previously denied knowing Jesus. Look at verse 15. When they finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? What's your Bible say? More than these. Scholars have wondered, what is he talking about? Is he talking about the fish? Do you love me more than the fish? Because he's gone fishing. I believe that's it. Do you remember when Jesus said he was going to be betrayed? And you remember what Peter said in his boldness? What did he say? Even if everybody falls away, I would never do that. I love you too much, Lord. And so now, now Jesus is questioning that. With everything that happened in the past, do you really love me more than these other disciples? So what follows in, in the text is a three-part conversation. Question, answer, question, answer, question, answer. Here's question number one. Verse 15. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And Peter said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he says, speak my words. Second question, verse 16. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. Verse 17, uh, verse 17, he said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he had said to him the third time, do you love me? He said to him, Lord, you know everything, and you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Now there's been uh, a lot said about those questions over the years, and I'll have more to say about it in a second. But pick it up in verse 18. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself, walk wherever you wanted. But when you're old, you'll be stretched out. Your hands will be stretched out and another will dress you, carry you where you do not wish to go. And John adds as a parenthetical statement, verse 19, this he said to show by what kind of death Peter was going to glorify God. And after he said this to him, he said, follow me. Now, there's an interesting thing going on when Jesus asks, do you love me? And Peter will respond with, do you, you know I love you? Because there are two different words used in Greek here. And the way it's usually talked about in sermons is somebody will say, Jesus says, do you agapalo me? Do you love me with this sort of sacrificial love, this deep sense of commitment love? 
And then you know, Peter answers him just using the word phileo. You know that I have this deep affection, friendship love for you. And that this goes back two or three times, and the last time it happens, Jesus uses phileo and kind of meets Peter where he is. I got some bad news for you though. If you've heard that in the past, I just wanna I just wanna say to you that those two words are used interchangeably as synonyms. All throughout the Gospel of John, there's nothing really of import there. It doesn't say that Peter was sad or grieved because Jesus had used a different word for love. It says specifically in verse 17, look at your Bible, why was Peter grieved that he had said this? It was because he asked him the third time. Peter knows what's going on. Remember back in 18, chapter 18, we had that other charcoal fire. How many times did Peter deny Jesus? Does anybody remember? Three times. And now here in John 21, how many times does Jesus ask? Three times. Do you love me? Peter knows. That's why he's grieving. Verse 17, because, because he asked him. For the third time, do you love me? And so Jesus is revealed here as the ruler over all things, the forgiver of all, with his mercy and grace available. And lastly, he reveals himself as the shepherd of our souls. This is another of John's great themes. You know, there are passages in John where he says, I am the good shepherd. Do you know when Jesus says that? He knows everybody's going to hear that as the 23rd Psalm. He's essentially saying, I am the great shepherd from the 23rd Psalm. That's a powerful statement. It's an arrogant statement if it weren't true. But it is true. And Peter himself is being challenged here to tend the sheep of Jesus, the great shepherd. To be a co-shepherd, in a sense. Because he becomes an elder. The shepherd of the flock. You ever notice uh, lambs, they're a mess, right? Sheep are really completely unable to take care of themselves. And you ever notice, you know, football season is about to kick off, and you ever notice the mascots for football teams? You know one you'll never find? You'll never find the Chicago Lambs, right? The closest you'll get is the L.A. Rams, but never the lambs, never the sheep. Sheep are virtually helpless and they need a shepherd. And so when Peter is given this charge to, to care for Jesus' sheep, does Peter obey this charge? Yes or no? Absolutely. Acts chapter 2, he's the one standing up on the day of Pentecost proclaiming Jesus. All of the disciples become apostles were preaching that day, but Peter is, is focused on, he's the spokesman for the group. And he preaches Christ on that day. And, and all those successive chapters in Acts where he's continuing to preach Christ boldly now, having been restored by Christ. He's establishing churches. And all throughout, he's being that shepherd that Jesus wanted him to be. And that brings us to a pattern, a pattern for restoration, which Gary read for us in Acts 8, where a previously baptized man having fallen away because he desires the Holy Spirit and its powers by way of money. He is told, verse 22, repent and pray that this would be forgiven. You didn't tell him you have to be baptized the second time. He says, repent and pray. And that's the model for us. And Peter further shows himself to be a shepherd by writing two very important letters that are found towards the end of your New Testament. Man, I, I really hope you see in this text Jesus as ruler of all, one in whom you can place your trust, the forgiver of all, and the shepherd of your soul. And as we close right here, I want to just think for a moment back to that charcoal fire. That was a significant event in the life of Peter. I'll guarantee you, John writes it for a reason. 
Only two times in the New Testament where it's ever to be found, charcoal fire. He's doing that on purpose. And Peter, I think, forevermore, when he saw a charcoal fire, remembered these two events. But how much different would his life have been if the first one was the only one that had happened and not the second? He never forgot that. And I wonder about your own life. Is there a moment like that where when you look back at your life, you have deep regrets and you have things that have been unmet, that have not been dealt with in regards to your relationship to your God. Maybe you need a moment like this around your own fire where there's repentance and prayer for your restoration. The crazy thing is that He offers death. He restores us and forgiveness forgives us because that is who Jesus is. Let's pray about it. Father, we're before you this morning offering our worship, unraveling your text, allowing it to feed our hearts and minds, and I pray today that, that it would. I pray we would be in this state constantly of reaching heavenward to you. Thinking of our own spiritual walk, whether or not we're walking in the light. Not in the darkness, but a new day dawning in our own lives. May that be the case. I pray you would help us. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Love is burning in our hearts like living